Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone, and welcome to the Umarpreneur podcast. With me today, I have a brother that I'm very excited to bring on this podcast to share his knowledge with you. And this is Brother Jamal Ahmed. Jamal, assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the podcast. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And thank you very much for inviting me to be on this lovely podcast. Alhamdulillah. It's, uh, the pleasure is all mine. And uh, we want to introduce people to you. But honestly, I, I, I know what you do. I know it's in security. I know it's in data protection. But I want you to share it with me in your own words. Because I think you're a better fit to let people know what you specialize in, what your business is about. Yeah. So we specialize in, so as a business, we specialize in the two things. So on the business to business side, we specialize in providing world-class GDPR and other data privacy compliance solutions so businesses can really protect their reputation but go beyond achieving compliance and really help to inspire trust and cultivate confidence from all of their stakeholders which mm. helps them to if they're a charity make a bigger impact and if they're a business ultimately maximize their revenue mm -hmm. and on the b2c side uh, i also have an academy the privacy pros academy and this is where i'm building a community of ambitious professionals who come together to empower businesses to adopt honest privacy practices so that together we can really help them to help every single man, every single woman, every single longest mm. child on this planet to enjoy the freedom over their personal information. Mashallah, that sounds uh, like a beautiful mission. And I'm sure you didn't stumble into this, or you might have, but what led you to build this business that focuses specifically on data privacy? Yeah, so it was around, um, I think it was around 2016, 2017, data privacy was, um, the GDPR was being spoken about. It was actually uh, being introduced. And I remember reading across it and coming across it. I was like, you know what? There's no way a big business is going to let this happen because it basically means they have to change how everything is happening. And I was like, you know, this is fascinating. And the more I read into it, the more captivated I became. But around that time, um, I, I, I was blessed with good news, actually. I was blessed with really good news, good tidings from Allah. Uh, my wife fell pregnant. Uh, we was in a marriage, for, I think, for about seven, six, seven years by that time. And uh, we had some fertility challenges, but this was now, you know, Allah's just blessed us with this amazing news. And at the time, I was in the corporate sector, specifically in financial services. And I remember sitting there and thinking, you know what, Allah's blessed me with this child. But part of my role and may Allah forgive me, involves calculating interest. And I remember um, when we are, I was in one of these lessons and they were telling, you know, the person who deals with interest, the person who pays interest, the person who receives interest, it's like they're going on jihad with Allah and his messenger. And that scared me. Mm. But then it was like the person who records the interest is just as bad. And I was like, you know what? I don't want to be in a situation where I'm having... Uh, to, you know, give, b b b being when I'm going to have a weapon put in my hand and say, go and fight uh, your prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the command he created me. And, you know, I was like, you know, Allah, please um, help me to have halal income so I can raise a pious child and have a beautiful family. Allah, please help me. And I honestly believe to this day that it's only that dua that I made to Allah because I had a sincere intention that I wanted halal income. I wanted to get away from what I was doing. And Allah has really uh, blessed me with the opportunity to go and serve people, go and serve businesses and do it on a scale where, alhamdulillah, I've been dubbed the king of data protection by the BBC. I'm recognized all over the world for the expertise I bring to this industry. And in fact, the International Association of Privacy Professionals awarded me with the Fellow of Information Privacy. And I was the first British Muslim to uh, be given such recognition and be awarded that. And also the first person of Bangladesh region to be granted such a status. Alhamdulillah. Mashallah. May Allah increase you in status, brother, and uh, in success. And, uh, you know, to bring it back to who you are at, at the core, because I think behind every great business is a great entrepreneur. You, what were you doing in that stage in your life when you decided to embark into entrepreneurship? Were you already an entrepreneur? Were you already working on several businesses? Were you working a job at the time and then eventually decided to transition to doing your own thing? What was that like? Yeah, so if I'm honest with you, I've always been quite entrepreneurial. Um, I, I, I grew up um, 
with family businesses, supporting, I'm the oldest child. So naturally when my father had businesses, it would be me who would be supporting, who would be working with him. And the truth is I actually started getting involved in the family business um, when I was a young child, about seven, six, seven years old. That's when my dad would take me to the shop and say, hey, sit on the table or learn this or do this and I'll be supporting him. And throughout my um, childhood, when most people were out playing, um, getting up to mischief and stuff, I was sitting there uh, supporting my dad and the family business to bring some food to the table and keep the family going. So I think a lot of the entrepreneurial spirit was probably nurtured throughout my childhood. Um, as I grew older, I dabbled in a few entrepreneurial projects um, when I was at university. I used to do a lot of life coaching. Uh, I used to teach other people how to do speed reading and all this personal development stuff. And later on, I had a couple of other you know, businesses. Um, so business is something that has always been in my blood. It's something that's always been in my history. But it really all came together. And I, th I would say all of these things have been helping me build up to where I am now to where we actually, um, alhamdulillah, are doing a good job serving people, serving people well. Oh. Like serving people with a level of excellence where our reputation precedes us and where the biggest companies come to you and say, hey, we'd like you to train our staff or we want to work with you. We don't want anyone else. Amazing, mashallah. And for you to, to get to this point, people who are listening to this uh, to this podcast are usually in the early stages or in the stages where they're still a small business and building a team and figuring out you know how to hire how to scale in your in your journey uh, through building this business what was it that you could share with us in terms of lessons maybe a lesson or two from the early days when you were just starting off and you had to build a team and go and get customers and start to build some brand recognition yeah, so I, I would still say we're in startup stage. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're definitely not, you know, um, ready to scale. We're still growing. We're still learning. We're still developing. Uh, uh, what, what, so the question is, what is the kind of top mm -hmm. tips I can share with yeah. other uh, umapreneurs or entrepreneurs that are listening? Exactly. The first thing I would say is you need to get yourself a mentor, right? It doesn't matter who you are, wherever you are right now, your best thinking has got you to the stage you are now which means for you to progress from wherever you are right now, your best thinking is not going to be enough to get to the next stage. You need to get uncomfortable. You need to find someone who's been there, done it before, and has helped other people. And sometimes you're going to have to invest money mm. and your time to go and learn how to do that. So that's the best piece of advice I can give to anyone is get yourself a mentor. Whatever you're doing, whether you want to be an athlete, whether you want to be an entrepreneur, whether you want to uh, be a, uh, an expert or an artist, anything in life, find somebody who's gone, who's done it before you, has helped other people do it, and go and invest and spend time with that person and really have them as a mentor to guide you, to stop you making the mistakes that they've made and they've discovered not to make. And that's really going to save you not only a lot of time, but it's also going to save you a lot of money. And as you progress and you mature as an individual, the one thing you will realize is time is your most valuable asset. Right? Time is the most valuable asset. Money will come and go. You will make mistakes. You'll make good money. You'll do good deals. you lose them. That's going to come and go, right? So forget about that. As long as you've got enough to maintain you and Allah um, is going to bless you with the barakah, that's fine. The other thing we have to remember is whatever is written for you is written for you. No one can take that from you. And if it's not written for you, it's not going to happen. And Allah tests us different ways. He will test us on our results. So that means you will have to put in the effort and sometimes he will reward you and other times he won't. But regardless, whatever is written for you is out there. But that doesn't mean that it's going to come and um, you, you know knock on your door and say, here's a million pounds and it's going to be in your bank account. You still have to make your effort. Even if you look at all of the Quranic stories, even the story of Moses, what did Allah say to Moses? Strike your stick, right? Mm -hmm. And then the sea parted. It didn't just part. Everything, any, every prophet that you see, any mirac miracles in the Quran, whatever you see, Allah says, make your effort. And I think in this day and age, most of us are familiar with the uh, term tie your camel. What does it mean to tie your camel? For me, the philosophy I can take away is it means to me, do your best and Allah will do the rest. Mm -hmm. That's it. If you haven't done your best, you're not in any position to complain about anything. You're not even in any position to ask for anything because you haven't done your best. Some, you can't help someone who is not willing to help themselves. Allah is not going to help somebody who is lazy. Allah is not going to help someone who is not making their effort. Allah will answer your prayers. Inshallah, he answers all of our prayers. But you have to do your best effort. And you have to be sincere in what you want to do. And, you know, one of the things that really um, 
makes me feel good about the work we do is it brought me closer to Islam. It brought me closer to Islam because when I was looking to get into something, I was like, you know, obviously I want to move away from address, but I want to do something that benefits people, that benefits society. And I started looking at what does Islam actually say about privacy? Because, you know, in, 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 we're here in the UK and worldwide Europe and the UK, when it was part of the European Union, were seen as the people who are forward thinking when it comes to talking about your privacy. And let me just explain what we mean by privacy. So privacy is having freedom over your personal information. So that means I'm not looking into your house, seeing what you're doing. I'm not opening your wallet and having a look. I'm not reading your emails. I'm not putting a surveillance camera in front of you. So that's your privacy, right? But you know what? If you go back 1400 years before you have the GDPR, before you have Data Protection Act, before you have governments bringing all this in, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam really respected privacy and if you look at uh, if, when you go back in history and you look at the ottoman empire did you know that they had two doorbells really they had a one for men, and they had a smaller one for women so if a man knocked the man would answer and if a woman knocked the woman would answer and also we are taught when you knock on the door you should stand to the side so that when they open the door you don't peer in and invade mm -hmm. their privacy Mm -hmm. And even, I, th I think, he, uh, forgive me uh, for my mistakes if I'm mistaken here, but I believe it was uh, Umar, um, who, who was one of the leaders um, after Abu Bakr, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. he said to people, or he told them off for entering the house through the back door, because mm -hmm. you might startle your wife and the people who occupy your house and you're invading their privacy. So he said, you should come through the front, but do not go through the back door because you're invading the privacy. But the thing that really brought it home for me was um, wh when I read about this story. So somebody came to visit the Prophet uh, to ask him a question of whatever reason it was. And when he got to the house of the Prophet, um, he thought, let me not disturb him. Let me see what the Prophet is doing. And he peered through the hole and he saw that he was actually in, in prayer. He was worshipping Allah. So he thought, you know, what? I don't want to disturb him. Um, I'll catch up with him later. Anyway, later on, they bump into each other in the market. And he says, oh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I came to meet with you earlier, but you were praying and therefore I didn't disturb you. But I have a question to ask or whatever it is that he wanted to discuss with him. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, hold on a minute. How do you know I was praying and that you did not want to disturb me? Do you mean that you pried through my heart? You, you, you pried into my personal space? I, I'm paraphrasing here. So forgive mm. me for that. Of course. And he says, yes, I looked through the hole and I saw you was praying. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Something to the effect of, you shouldn't do this. If you peer into somebody's house and they strike you with the weapon or they throw a stone at you, and if that were to kill you, there is no sin on that person. Which really rams home how important privacy is in Islam and how much we value one's privacy. And it makes me really sad when you see, uh, especially in Muslim charities uh, here in the, in the UK and other parts of the West where they're, have no respect for people's privacy. At the same time, they're saying, hey, trust us with the amana of your money. Mm. Amana, that trust is not just money, it's also personal information. If I'm going to make a donation and I'm going to give you my phone number and my email address, I don't want you selling it to the highest bidder. I don't want you to share it with 50 other charities so I get to a point where I'm harassed and I feel bad about trying to do something good for the ummah, mm. right? And um, I mean, I, I speak very passionate about it. I wrote an article. Sometimes I get shut down a little bit. But the reason I advocate for this is because, you know, I want the Muslims, I want Muslim businesses, I want Muslim charities to actually lead the way and set an example of what good privacy practices look like. I want people to look at Muslim charities and Muslim businesses and say, you know what, that's how you do privacy. And that's how you respect people to get their trust, inspire confidence, and ultimately have a bigger impact. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the way I delivered the message doesn't always come across with the charities who I'm trying to work with. But you know what? Over the last couple of years, we managed to turn where they thought I was an enemy and now they can actually see how valuable I am and how I'm lobbying for them, how I'm speaking to the government saying we want the charities to be able to market differently. And I'm also holding to account those charities who are actually doing such a bad disservice to Muslims, especially here in the UK, that people don't even want to donate to charity. They're like, you know what, I'm just going to give money back home or I'm going to wait until I find something or I'm going to even donate to another charity because I don't trust Muslim charities because they just harass me. And this is what we want to get away from because just in the month of Ramadan, I think we donate just in the UK around 400 million pounds. Oh,
Yeah, imagine how much more we could get together and how much more of an impact we could have to serve the ummah if people did not worry about giving their phone number, giving the email address, and they was happy to make donations whenever a charity asked for help. And mm-hmm. that's where we want to get to a stage is where any business comes to do business with you or you want to do business, you don't even think twice about giving them your email address, your phone number, your postal address, because you know they're going to treat it with the utmost respect and only do what they say they're going to do with it. And if they want to do something other than that, they would have get your consent or they would inform you. But you know what? Alhamdulillah, you trust them, not just with your money, but also with your personal information. Mm-hmm. And that's where we want to get to. So what do you think right now about the fact that this is the way that technology is trending is in the complete opposite direction where yes you have some you know companies that will say yes we value your privacy your messages are encrypted but more and more the 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 essence of the technologies that are being developed right now require that the lack of privacy from people they require for people to put in their information even you look at something basic like social media and facebook they want to know everything. What's your marital status? What day were you born? Who were your friends? Enter your close friends, your interests, your movies, the things that you like. Who, what kind of photos do you comment on? By the end of the day, they have a complete profile of who you are as a person. And I'm pretty sure it's going to get even more worse with the metaverse. What's your opinion on that in terms of where it's trending? Yeah. So, I mean, it's scary. It's mm. really scary because um, if, if you think back to recent elections, if you think back to the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Yeah. You have you have big tech profiling individuals, getting to know them so intimately and so much better than the people they're married to, the people they're living with, they're even sometimes better than their parents, because they know exactly what you're doing every second of the day. If you've got your location service set on, they know exactly where you are, who you're next to, how long you've been there, what shop you're in, uh, which church you're in, which mosque you're in, which uh, political party protest you're going to support, where you like to go shopping, what kind of articles you like to read. What kind of things you're interested in and spending your time on social media? media. And what we're seeing is people are becoming more and more polarized because they're like, oh, this person likes this. So they give them more of that. But what's happening is people are losing sense of reality and they just get trapped down these rabbit holes and they just get more and more exposed to one thing, which means they're very polarized and they're becoming less balanced. And when you look at things like recent election results, you'll see we're seeing more polarized election results than ever before. People are either extreme over here or the extreme over there. And there's less people in the middle because these political um, campaigns are being run using people's data and they're targeting them specifically with the ideology to really brainwash them towards those things. And that's just politics. When it comes to other areas of life, especially if, if for, for, for those entrepreneurs who are listening and who have children, like I would say it's a very scary place to be in right now because it's, it's, it's like um, they're competing for attention. And what we a lot of people are arguing right now is we're living in an attention economy where everyone is competing for attention. And because everyone's competing for attention so much, our attention spans are getting smaller. And if our attention spans are getting smaller, what does that mean for our brain development? What does that mean for us as a society moving forward? And when you know, you've got this TikTok and this Instagram, and the, 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 the thing I like to compare them to is fruit machines. So you know, astaghfirullah, when people go and gamble, right? They have these fruit machines and you put money in and you pull the lever yeah. and it goes ping, ping, ping. And you don't know what's going to come up because you have uncertainty of what's going to come up. Your brain gets excited. And then when it lands, you get a dopamine shot. Yeah. And then you're like, you know what? That was fun. Let me do it again. Here's a few more coins. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what's happening with our mobile phone devices. Yeah. And this is, this is purposely built by design. You go on Instagram, you go on TikTok, you go on Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever it is. You go, oh, you, you scroll down just like the fruit machine. It refreshes uncertainty you don't know what's going to come up is there more likes is there more comments is there something new on the on the screen boom you get a dopamine hit and that's what keeps people engaged and that's what keeps people addicted to their devices but no one tells you that no one tells you they've taken that same science of how you're hooked onto gambling and so um, and gambling machines and applied that onto your phones which you're carrying around with you all the time and you see people walking around on their phones they're walking into cars they're walking into trees they're getting themselves involved in accidents and it's, it's, it's getting really, really scary. It is getting a little bit ridiculous. And I think, you know what, as an ummah, as Muslims, as people who remember Allah, who are bowing down five times a day, we need to remind ourselves that we need to detach. We need to unplug 
and we need to keep a sense of balance. And we also want to make sure that we protect our privacy because the more cookies we accept, the more accounts that we create, the more we give away the way we're thinking, the way we're behaving, our patterns, our shopping, the more susceptible we are to being influenced. And the person with the most money is going to ultimately influence the people we become, the choices we make, and ultimately how we choose to live our life. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you know is, you know, it's the shaitan's biggest goal to distract us. He's not going to say give up your religion, right? He's not going to say go and kill someone or go and commit a, a sin. But what he will say is, you know what, let me keep you distracted. Because if I'm keeping you distracted, you're not worshipping Allah. If I'm keeping mm -hmm. you distracted, you're not serving your parents. If I'm keeping you distracted, you're not serving your community. You're not doing something that's going to be beneficial for you, rather detrimental for you. And if I can keep your attention for long enough, and then if I can start introducing little bits of stuff to make you question things, to take away your attention, to make you see something over time, Shaitan is going to you know, really start winning these battles. And Shaitan is very patient. So remember, when he, the, the people first started worshipping idols, what happened? He says to them, hey, build, build, these, um, build, build these idols so that you can remember these pious people. That's what he said to the first generation, right? So they built these people and they were like, oh yeah, these are pious people and they remind us to worship Allah. Then the next generation came in and he goes to them after hundreds of years and say, hey, you know these uh, idols, your forefathers used to worship them. Why don't you worship them too? And that's how idol worshipping began. He's very patient. He takes time. And this is what scares me right now when I see our um, attentions being taken up by these social media applications. Um, for oftentimes, nothing more than some amusement and entertainment at the expense of everything else. Anyway, that's enough ranting about that. No, 100%. That's, uh, I'm in complete agreement <laughs> with you, to be honest. I'm sorry, I'm sorry uh, for going off topic. But I, get I completely in agreement with you. So how does one balance that when you're an entrepreneur and, and you know that social media is a crucial part of your strategy when it comes to acquiring clients and growing your business? I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. You, get, uh, so you hire somebody to manage your social media for you. Hmm. Right? You get someone to hire, manage your social media because as an entrepreneur, social media presence is massive right now. Yeah. Right? If, you, if you want a successful business in this day and age, especially if it's a service business in the digital space, then your social media presence is going to have a massive impact on how well or how badly you do as a company. Awesome. Now, whether if you're in a professional like I am, then you will be really big on LinkedIn and you're going to want to spend a lot of investment time and energy on growing your reputation and connecting with the right people and sending the right messages and attracting people to your message. But if you're spending all your time doing that, then who's going to run the rest of your business and who is actually making sure you're looking after your family, you're spending time with your wife, you're spending time with your children, you're giving time for your relatives, you're giving time for your parents and doing all of the things that means that we are having a rounded, solid, structured life, right? Because trust me, as soon as you start investing time on social media, you will discover, you know what, now there's adverts, now there's hashtags, now I have to follow these influencers and comment on them, and then those influencers have to comment back on me, and I have to add people, and then I have to message them, and I have to follow up, and then I have to get a lead magnet, and you know what, the only way to unplug and get away from all that is to hire someone to take care of it for you. And yes, you know what, it is expensive to get good people, but the freedom that you get from that is amazing, right? I'm so fortunate to be in a place where I learned from my mistakes in the past and I managed to say, you know what, I'm going to hire people to manage my social media accounts. I'm going to get them to do all the postings. I'm going to get them to do all the responses. Mm -hmm. So I don't actually have to spend much time on them at all. Mm -hmm. I'll go in every now and then just to see are they doing what they're supposed to do? Are they missing out on anything? Give them a few pointers. But as an entrepreneur, that is the best way to unplug from it is to outsource it and if, if you really worried about budget then you can get vas right you can go to the philippines you can get vas for a couple of dollars per hour you can outsource it to other parts of the world such as pakistan and india and there's very good people there who are really interested in doing all of this freelance stuff and you can bring them on and become they can become part of your team and if you train them and you look after them then you know what inshallah there will be uh, good additions to your team inshallah i uh, have another topic that i want to open up here uh, since I have you on. And this this is a topic that I'm curious to, to know your opinion about. I'm not sure if you have uh, researched it at all or if you've heard about it, 
Uh, it's called The Great Reset by the World Economic Forum. Have you heard about that at all? I have heard about it. I haven't be. I, I can't give you an expert opinion or an in-depth opinion okay. on it. I'm happy to have a uh, sure. So, so essentially, what the Great Reset is, uh, and actually, I won't even bother to explain it because it's a little bit more complex. But it's this initiative by the World Economic Forum, uh, and I, I think they've partnered recently with the UN. And it's essentially to to, to have more collaboration between all governments and countries that are part of the UN. Um, and part of that part part of that collaboration that they want to initiate, and this improvement in technology, and all these things that they they they. Uh, they are claiming that they want to do is actually the uh, diminishing of privacy. So uh, they, what they state in one of their, uh, literally in one of their, um, it's not like, uh, you know, their release statements or whatever it's called. I'm forgetting what the name, official name for that is, uh, white paper is essentially that for technology to advance, for them to develop the things that they need to develop, then the the, the privacy that we have now, the uh, the barriers, right, to uh, connectedness need to essentially fall apart, and so a big part of a big part of the Great Reset, essentially, if I were to sum it up and sum up my question, is that they want and they want to they want to push for that reduction in privacy. They want to actually remove individual privacy from people and tell people, well, look, if you want to benefit from technology, and even now, even something like uh, you look at insurance companies here in Canada, uh, they're like, hey, do you want to lower your rates? Download this app that tracks everywhere that you go and maybe we'll get give you a discount and i would never do that because there's no amount of money that would i would i would be okay saving to just have a company know where i am at all times you know it's just it's too much and so we're constantly seeing this kind of push for the lack of privacy for the reduction of privacy from from these companies and even from government and you know there are governments out there including china and other 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 governments that have a complete invasion of privacy of the people. So with your firm, with uh, uh, Cassiant and what you're doing, how are you solving that problem for your clients? Are you even solving that problem for your clients? Is that what you tackle? Are you tackling something entirely different? And do you see a future for yourself with the way the market is going? Yeah, absolutely. So look, there's a couple of things here. So from a commercial point of view, we can see that governments, regimes um, all over the world are bringing in data privacy and data protection laws because they realize, you know what, people have had enough. People are no longer willing to put up with their privacy being violated. And so you have governments bringing in data protection laws. In 2018, the GDPR came into force in, the, in, in, in Europe. And that was a huge game changer. And as soon as that happened, we see other countries saying, you know what, that looks great. The people in Europe really trust the companies now or well, that, that, that they think are looking after the data. And you know what? They're actually more willing to give them the data because they know it's going to be looked after. And we want to do trade. We want to create um, free trade and free movement, not just of capital and stuff, but we want free flow of data. How can we get free flow of data? You know, we need to increase the way we protect our citizens. We need to increase the way we protect the citizens in Europe. So let's bring in place our new data privacy regulations. And you can see in the US, we've got states introducing legislation. Even in Canada, you are reforming your data privacy laws. Um, Nigeria, they brought in the NDPR. Bangladesh have just drafted a proposal on their data privacy laws. India's one is stuck in the government. But China has just recently introduced a law. Saudi Arabia have introduced data privacy laws. So you can see all over the world, People are bringing in data privacy laws. And when you bring in data privacy laws, companies need to get compliant. If they don't, not only are they going to face reputational damage, but they're also going to have to pay enforcement fees and large fines. And the cost of getting things right outweighs that. But you know what? At the end of the day, if they can start getting fined for violating data privacy laws, then they lose the trust of their customers. Here in the UK, we had a company, Talk Talk, massive company, right? Uh, they, they probably had about 30% of the population signed up as customers with them at one point. They had a massive data breach. People didn't trust them. They lost 50% of their customers. And those customers said they would never do business with TalkTalk ever again. So they haven't just lost business, they've lost future business as well. And people still to this day haven't forgiven them and they don't want to do business with them. So you can see it has a massive impact. And reputation as a business is, you, you work so hard to build your reputation and just one little thing can tie that reputation and it can ruin you. So for businesses who are forward thinking, businesses who are honest, my firm, that's exactly what we want to do. And I had a, I had a mission, which was, you know, I want to help every single woman, every single man and every single child on this planet 
have freedom over the personal information to choose what happens with it. And that's why I set up Casey and Privacy Experts. And I realized, you know what? I can't do this by myself. <laughs> it doesn't matter how big my clients are. It doesn't matter who they are. There is no way I can do that by myself. There's no way, regardless of how big our company goes, we can do that by ourselves. But what we can do is we can train other people to have the same ethos, to have the same ethics all over the world. And that's where the Privacy Pros Academy comes in. And you know what? We'll have an army of people everywhere who are actually adopting organizations, businesses, governments all over the world to adopt those honest privacy practices so that together our community can really say we've made a massive difference and we're upholding the privacy rights of every single individual on this planet, inshallah. So who is the Privacy Pros Academy for? The Privacy Pros Academy is for any ambitious professional who wants to have a thriving career in data privacy and who also wants to get on board with this. So we can have people for, so for example, let me give you an example um, of someone who's gone through my academy. So we have something called a 12 week accelerator program. And one of the gentlemen who just completed and graduated from that, his name is Tahir. He was in the family business in the restaurant trade for about 10 years. And his father really discouraged him from you know, wanting more from actually going and getting an education. Uh, he got into some difficulties and then he ended up driving, uh, becoming an Uber driver. And he did that for four years and he just gave up on his dreams. And he was like, you know, that's what I'm going to be. And that's it. And his wife actually encouraged him to say, no, be more. You can do more. I believe in you. And his cousin had actually gone through my program in the last uh, round. And he came from a, a similar charity, charity background, having no technical experience, no legal experience. He went through my 12 week program and he got himself a role as a world-class privacy professional, in fact, for a big big tech company, multinational company. So he got inspired by that and he joined the next intake. And you know what, Alhamdulillah, right now he's celebrating on Turkey because he's just got a job offer. Somebody who didn't even have a CV when they joined 12 weeks ago, somebody who had no previous experience, no professional experience, nothing. He's gone through the program, got certified, and he's got himself a role as a data privacy professional and he's increased his income uh, significantly, mashallah, as well. So when you have people like that coming through, this is people with no previous experience and they want to pivot their career, it's life-changing for them. But then I have other people um, who have some experience or some professional experience and they want to pivot their career. So, for example, uh, there's another gentleman called Adnan. He was at KPMG and he came through the program. And he's now got himself a job with Reach PLC, which is after Google, they get the second most number of clicks in the UK, right? So he's worked for that company. He 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 came, he went through the program and he's increased his salary by 40%, alhamdulillah, right? And actually he tells his story on the, on our Privacy Pros podcast. Maybe um, you and your listeners can actually tune in and listen to that. So it's for, it's, it's for people like that. It's for people with no experience. It's for people with some experience. And it's also pe for people who have 20 years experience, 30 years experience, but they actually want to master their profession they want to have the confidence, the credibility, the authority to command themselves in a, an audience, to get buying from the stakeholders, to really understand how to pragmatically apply data protection laws so they get a win-win for their clients, for their businesses. And so, for example, uh, one of the people I trained recently was actually the, day, the lead counsel on data privacy at Facebook. She came to train with me for the Certified Information Privacy Manager Program to understand how to transition her in-house uh, how she transitioned from working for a law firm uh, to being in-house and the challenges of really putting together a privacy program. I had the director of UBS, the biggest investment bank in the world, come and also get trained on how to pragmatically apply some of these solutions in their bank. So it's for anyone who is an ambitious professional, whether you have some experience, whether you have no experience, or whether you have a lot of experience. Wherever you are in your journey, if you want more, then the Privacy Pros Academy is for you, provided you, you, you meet the ethics, that you meet the values that we have. And the key value that we have in all our businesses is number one is excellence, right? Ihsan, you have to strive for excellence. If you don't strive for excellence, then we don't want to know. We don't want to, want to be good enough. We don't want to get by. We don't get to where we are. We're not going to make anything happen unless we strive for excellence. Mm -hmm. Next is growth. You have to always be growing, right? You can't be stagnant because the moment you stand still, the world past you, rushes past you. We have to be at the forefront, and that's how you maintain your position as the leader in the industry. And number three is, you know what? We're going to work so hard. We're going to spend about 40 hours. Well, entrepreneurs spend about 80 hours a week, let's be honest, right, um, on the business. It has to be fun. 
right? There has to be fun in what you do and you have to enjoy it. So those are the three values that we build the businesses on and the three values that really drive us to be the best we can be um, from all aspects of our business and everything that we do at the academy and also at KZ Privacy Experts as a consultancy. Awesome, mashallah, that's amazing. So I want to ask you for someone listening to this who might be interested in, in being part of that, where's the best place for them to go? The best place for them to go. So first of all, I would say listen to the Privacy Pros um, podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, we're on Google, we're on Spotify, we're on all the usual platforms that you find it. So search out Privacy Pros podcast. Listen to some of the stories of the people who have been through the academy and see if you resonate with that. But also listen to some of the other industry professionals. So when you listen to the podcast, we have guests a little bit like this from the best privacy professionals from around the world. And they talk about their stories and they give some expert tips. And if any of that resonates with you, then just get in touch with us. You can get in touch with me on Facebook. You can get in touch with me on LinkedIn. You can get in touch on our website. Just go to the podcast first, have a listen. And if you like what you hear, if you like the energy, if you like what we stand for, then get in touch. We'll give you lots of information. We'll tell you all. I, mean, I think one thing that we do that everyone finds so strange is before we speak to anyone to come onto any of our courses or to do business with us, we encourage them to go and check out our competition. In fact, we give them a dossier. It says, here's our competition. Go and check them out before we even speak to you. And everyone's like, mad, like, Jamal, why did you do that? Like, you shouldn't be telling people about your competition. You should be telling them about you, not giving them information about other people. I said, you know what? When you're number one, when you're the best at what you do, when you can confidently say, I have the best deal in the world, and you have to be stupid to go with anyone else, you can do that. Because you know what everyone else is offering, and you have a value proposition that is significantly superior than anyone else. So if people want value for money, if people want quality, if people want to get things right first time, then they'd be they have to be stupid to say no to you. But if what they're looking for is cheap and nasty and they want to pay twice, then of course they can go to any of your competitors and we'll tell you exactly who they are and what they're doing. And then you can go and compare what they're doing with what we're doing. So you're in a position to make an informed choice. And I believe asking the question, why should they pick us rather than how do we get more clients is what's driven the results that we're getting where we're recognized as the number one um, data privacy training um, academy in the world. That's a good question for every entrepreneur to ask in their business, right? Why why us versus other competition? And what are we doing to serve our clients better, to get them better results, to just be better in general? Yeah. Uh, and this is, this is the problem, right? I be, uh, most people ask the question, how can we get more clients? How can we get more customers? How can we sell more products? How can we get more calls? You're asking the wrong question, Yeah. right? Yeah. The question you want to ask yourself is why should they pick us? How can I better serve them today? What more can I do to make their lives easier for the reason they come to us? 100%, 100%. And I think those are great. Those are some great notes to leave with uh, the entrepreneurs listening to this for them to as homework to be to kind of take these questions and ask yourself, write it down on a piece of paper after you listen to the podcast today and ask yourself why, why should your customers come to you? How are you differentiating yourself in a way where you are getting them better results, you're providing them with a better experience, and ultimately you're serving them at a higher level. Brother Jamal, there's a question that I ask every single person that comes on the podcast, and I'd love to ask it for you as well. If you could give one piece of advice to your 18-year-old self, what would that be? If he, you know, as he goes through this journey of life and eventually business that you're building now, you could give him one piece of advice, go back in time, what would that wow, be? Wow, that's a powerful question, isn't it? <laughs> if I could give my 18-year-old self one piece of advice, what would it be? I would definitely say invest in your education more, mm. right? And when I say invest in your education, I don't mean the formal academic education where you go and spend 10 grand on a postgraduate diploma that gets you nowhere. I mean, go and spend on education that's going to get you somewhere. Learn presentation skills. Learn how to think more efficiently. Learn how to do marketing. Learn how to hold better meetings. Learn all of the skills that's really going to help you propel whatever message and whatever purpose you have on this earth that's going to help you take it further. So go and invest in your education and find good mentors, right? I wish I'd started um, investing in mentors a lot earlier than I had. So if I could give myself one single piece of advice, it would be invest in mentors as part of your education. I love that, mashallah. Jazakallah khair for joining us and for saying that. And, you know, we mentioned earlier the Privacy Pros podcast. If someone wants to connect with you specifically, learn more about Kazian, where should they go? 
I think the best place to connect with me is on LinkedIn. Um, so you can just go and search Jamal Ahmed. And when you go there, you should see a brown face, uh, bald with an orange background. And if you go across there, you'll probably see me there. And feel free to connect or follow me. And if you want to reach out and have a conversation, I'd be more than happy to make some time to have a chat with you. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jamal. It was an absolute pleasure to have you. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure. And you guys know the drill. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. Leave us a rating and review whenever you can. And if you would like to keep up with Omrepreneur as well, uh, we'll make sure to include the links beneath uh, the video. So check us out on Instagram or YouTube. Uh, these are the two platforms we'll be focusing on moving forward, inshallah. And we'll also include the links that Brother Jaman mentioned, his podcast, his LinkedIn, and his website that you can check out as well. And until then, we'll see you in the next episode, guys. Take care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.